looks good. Um, and yeah, so I'm happy to um, introduce this second seminar of our um, ECMM Global Guidelines Series. Um, and this is focusing on rare mold infections. So we had mucomycosis seminar um, a few weeks ago. Now it's um, rare molds. Um, there will be others coming in fall, so in late summer and fall on rare yeasts and endemic mycosis. Um, and specifically, of course, for this guideline, I want to not only thank the ECMM and Oliver Cornelis team who initiated the guideline together, um, but also our collaborating societies, particularly ISHAM and the American Society of Microbiology and all these other um, over 50 societies from around the world who endorse this guideline. And it's important to emphasize because today we have a very European panel here, but this guideline is a worldwide guideline. And how we wanted to set up these um, webinars is um, that we kind of like offer these in different time zones um, with local or you know uh, speakers from the from each continent um, do do um, these different areas of the world. So this is now the European version. Of course, everybody is happy to is, is invited to join um, if they can make this time. Um, I'm currently in San Diego, where it's eight in the morning, so this might not work for everyone here, right? Um, and same for other time zones. But we will offer other versions of these um, seminars um, with local speakers, um, with speakers from the same nations. Um, again, for example, for the Americas, that's something that's upcoming um, with Tom Walsh and Marcinucci, um, hopefully sometime in late June or July, um, we will be talking about rare molds. And the same is true also for the other guidelines. So it's not, um, we don't want to, we don't, can't emphasize enough that this is a global effort and not just a European effort. And this is just the European um, version of the rare mold seminar. So um, with that, I think let's start it. And I'm very excited to have, you know, two um, outstanding experts and rising stars in the field of rare molds um, presenting today, um, who were really both, you know, unsung heroes in the guideline, who had kind of like a big contribution to the guideline um, as well. And we will start off first with Professor Michaela Lachner from the University of Innsbruck who um, was one of the leaders of the diagnostic part of the guideline. And she will obviously talk about the diagnostics of rare mold infections. So please, Michaela, take it away. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Martin. And I will now try to share my screen with all the participants. So it's a great pleasure to talk today about, I just need to share it. So, so just maybe while you start sharing it, one yeah, housekeeping sure. issue, you can you all ask the um, questions in the chat and then I will, we will just discuss them at the end of the, each talk. Yeah, so thanks very much. I think everybody could see, can see my slides now. So it's a great pleasure to present today the guidelines uh, for rain molds and I will take over the specific part of diagnostics as already Martin highlighted. So this is my disclosure slide. And here we can see basically uh, the publication that has been launched in 2021 in Lancet Infectious Disease. And this was led by the initiative of Martin Hoenigl and Oliver Corneli that was already highlighted. And it's a global guideline for the diagnosis and management of rare mold infections. And as the president of the ECMM already highlighted that's a joint cooperation also with the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology and the American Society for Microbiology. So here we can see the coverage that we have reached writing this guideline. And this has been reviewed and endorsed by 54 scientific, uh, scientific societies, including 38 uh, countries worldwide. So we can see that there is a very broad consensus on this guideline and that should be one of the standard guidelines that should be wor uh, used worldwide. And we can see here uh, the paper and that's basically the person of you paper that has been published in the Lancet Infectious Disease. But I want to highlight also that that's just a very brief summary. But if you want to see the comprehensive document which uh, includes 263 pages. So that's basically all the knowledge about rare mold infections that we have gathered with this huge set of international experts that are interested in mold uh, infections. So if you want to have 
uh, more detailed look on how we came to these conclusions, what evidence there is, and all the details that are basically available for these rare fungal better chance, please look into this extra section. And there you see a one, so there's one document and that's the supplementary appendix with the full guidelines and all the evidence that we have collected to set this up. So what will we cover in this rare uh, mold guideline? So there's different generas that we will cover. Fusarium, Cetosporium, Ramsomsonia, Schizophyllum, Scopolariopsis, Bacillomyces, Penicillium, non manefe Dalloromyces, Buporiosilium, Lomentospora, and then a complex of various genera, which is uh, pulled under the term fair high for my seeds. So diagnostics is based on multiple angles. So the classical approach is microscopy, culture, and MIC testing. More modern techniques include antigen-based assays and nucleic acid-based assays and also MALDI-DAF. Also very important for setting a diagnosis is imaging studies. So here I want to start the first uh, so I want to know how the status is in your lab or clinics. So does your diagnostic lab offer, uh, what does it offer for the diagnostics of fungal infections? And for this, I will start uh, the ball. So you can see here, uh, there's, um, you should see that now on your screen. So. That's actually not mine. <laughs> so that's the question of Rosanna. So that's mine. Our diagnostic lab offers for the diagnosis of fungal infection. First answer, exclusively microscopy, histopathology and culture. Or second option, all of the above plus antifungal susceptibility testing. Third option, all of the above plus antigen tests, or all of the above, but uh, replacing antigen tests with nucleic acid based tests, or does your lab offer the full set of uh, diagnostic approaches? So you should actually apply for ECMM Excellence Center, or is it, I'm not sure how the microbiologists come to their names, or I'm not aware how fungal infections are diagnosed in my center. So if you can vote now. Michaela, I think, can you advance the slides and this will open the voting because we don't have a vote option yet. There's no, no vote. So if you just advance, maybe this helps. Otherwise, Jan can jump in. Uh, for me, I have already got the result of the vote from Please one person. Can. From one person, okay, at least one can vote. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, okay. Because I get a lot of messages in the chat that people can't vote. Okay, um, so somehow somebody managed. Oh yeah, I have one. So I just uh, released the result from the votes, but there's only one person so that has voted. So I'm not sure. <laughs> But maybe if that doesn't work, we just skip that part and maybe discuss that at the, at the end of the slide. What do you think, Marcus, uh, Martin? I'm thinking, I'm just retrying because at one point, and maybe I don't know if Jan is still here who can jump in and help us because he's obviously the biggest um, technical expertise. But I'm always questioning. Oh. So for me, it says the Anna is true, actually said doing. the problem is we have to answer four questions at the same time to validate our vote. Okay, let's just, uh, I think, okay. let's just continue for now and kind of like try to fix this and maybe kind of like ask these questions again at the end. Um, that would make yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, I think that's maybe better. Yeah. Otherwise, 
we lose too much time. There's more votes incoming now, so there's a few more. I don't know if this can just run in the background. Um, Jan may be able to, but let, let's just continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I will follow up with that later on. So that's uh, just a brief overview how we came to the recommendation in the guideline. So grade A is strongly recommended, B moderately, C uh, marginally, and uh, basically D is recommended against. And we have basically color coded this in uh, the overview for diagnostic recommendation that I will go through with you. Uh, in a couple of minutes. So green means strongly recommended, uh, yellow moderately recommended and uh, orange marginally recommended. We don't have a red code uh, in the slides that I show you. And also for the quality of evidence, we have to stress here that for rare molds, we basically have the evidence on the level two and level three because there are no properly designed randomized color, uh, controlled trials for setting the diagnostics of these sorts of infections. So we get started now with the actual uh, slides summarizing what we have concluded upon. And so uh, for Lomentospora, the first uh, genus of fungal pathogens, we see here that we have also this fungi occurring in cystic fibrosis patients. Therefore, there's an additional angle to the general uh, any other population, so this is stressed separately. And very important here for direct microscopy and histology is that this fungus gro uh, grows with highly melanized uh, irregular branching septated hyphae. And also special for Lomentospora is that it actually is able to sporulate not only in the culture, but also in histological uh, preparation. So you might be able to see these spores occurring. And that's also uh, suspected that these spores also disseminate to the bloodstream and therefore we also can see blood cultures. So direct microscopy histology and blood cultures is highly recommended uh, for this uh, pathogen. And in addition for cystic fibrosis patients, we also recommend the usage of C-cell plus, that's a selective medium and other media that basically hinder the fast growing uh, fungi such as Aspergillus to overgrow these uh, fungi that grow at the lower speed. And for pure cultures, there's also a strong recommendation for ITS uh, sequencing to get basically to a species identification. If we move on to Cetosporium, that has been a joint genera in the past, but has been separated. And that for a very good reason, because Cetosporium is actually a high yellow hyphomycete. So it grows with transparent hyphae in the histology. We see again, irregulated septated hyphae in both direct and histology. And we also have, again, the same additional patient cohort of cystic fibrosis patients. And we, again, need to use a selective medium to be able to detect this uh, fungi. Also here, we have the recommendation to use idea sequencing for the identification of the species from pure cultures, not from clinical specimens. And then we also have a uh, moderate recommendation for antifungal susceptibility testing and the usage of Maldidov MS. Also important for imaging is that we also need to consider that this fungi is able to uh, cause disseminated infection, often also with sudden S involvement. So we skip the questions and move on to Fusarium, actually the most common amongst the rare mold uh, better chance. And here we have for this, for setting the diagnostics, some additional uh, features. So first of all, uh, this uh, rare molds occur in hematological and also neutropenic patients. They present with persisting fever or respiratory symptoms. And also there is another special disease entity, uh, fungal keratitis caused by Fusarium as well. For the keratitis, obviously, we need to gain corneal scrabbings or tissue biopsies. And for the other patient cohorts, of course, uh, there is a repeated galactomanan strongly recommended if the patient has been 
positive previously because what was found is that uh, the, the drop in galactomannan levels correlate with a treatment response. So this is strongly stressed out to do. And also galactomannan in serum is moderately uh, recommended uh, for this better chance. Again, a main uh, focus has to be put on direct microscopy, so the classical methods and histology. Here these fungi grow again as hyaline hyphae, so transparent hyphae. You can see an example down on the left side of the slide. Uh, with these acute angles of branching that you can see here, the pure cultures present with this banana-shaped macroconidia, which are very characteristic for these fungi. And also important to note here is that the MIC values do not always correlate with the clinical outcome. There's for, we don't have here uh, antifungal susceptibility testing uh, recommended. And again, for pure cultures, IDS sequencing is recommended together with the DF alpha sequencing as well as an alternative marker. So for the other, uh, rare molds like Schizophilum or other basidiomycetes. I want to stress just uh, quickly that they're, they are all as a class of basidiomycetes. There's way less than ascomycetes uh, causing infections in humans. So you can see that they're on the other basidiomycetes, there's just a couple of phylla uh, listed. And what you can see very easily when you have a trained eye is these clasps occurring at the position of a scepter. So if you have these uh, occurring, you know that you're dealing with a basidiomycet. And there's not so many of these uh, rare basidiomycetes that come in question, most commonly schizophilum and also homographiella aspergillata, for example, in, in hematological patients. So these basidiomycetes occur in chronic granuloma dosis disease, hematological patients. And again, we have the strong emphasis on direct microscopy, culture from any site. Here we particularly look out for these clasps occurring and also in histology. And we use ITS-1 and ITS-2, again, for species identification based on pure cultures. Then we have the next big group of uh, fair hyphomycosis. So that's basically just describing a morpho stage of fungi, how they occur and present in histological preparations. So here we have an example presented. So the fair hyphomycosis means that they are darkly pigmented, uh, uh, forming darkly pigmented hyphae. So we can see this in these uh, slides. And uh, they also have this um, uh, branching and septating occurring on a regular basis, but you can see there's a huge number of genera pooled under this term with different uh, features and different characteristics, but they're so rare and little is known about them so that they are not separately listed. So there's lots of diagnostics that we have to do. Again, we have any population and separately again cystic fibrosis patients and then also our heavily immunocompromised patient, patients that have received hematological stem cell transplantation or solid organ transplantation. Now for the very rare, the rarest amongst the rare, so to say, uh, uh, fungi, we basically are fully reliant on uh, classical uh, diagnostics, there is no additional uh, tests that we can apply. So there is the strongest recommendation again on culture microscopy and histology, basically just seeing uh, fungal elements, trying to cultivate the fungus and then identify with IDS sequencing or better tubulin sequencing. And that basically applies for all the rare and rarest genera of molds that we see. So again, here is always the emphasis on uh, direct microscopy, try to culture the fungi, make histological preparation, and then also try to identify from pure cultures. So there's no molecular tests that are established uh, for these fungi, 
So we are fully uh, dependent on ITS sequencing or an expert being able to morphologically identify these fungi, which is sometimes challenging and sometimes impossible because they grow as sterile mycelium and then we are fully dependent on IDS sequencing. Same is true also for penicillium. Uh, again, here is a stressed direct microscopy with the strongest recommendation. Try the culture if possible. Uh, make a histological examination of your biopsy materials and try to identify with IDS sequencing. That basically goes through for all these rarest genera, also for the non manefi Thaleromyces, Bacillomyces, and Bulbaryocilium. So I will not uh, dig too deep into that. And also antifungal susceptibility testing is here only moderately recommended due to the fact that uh, we don't have clinical breakpoints for these rarest molds. And there's limited uh, knowledge about the correlation of the MIC values with uh, the prediction of the clinical outcome and the treatment success that we base on them. So therefore only moderately recommended and also only moderately recommended Maldidov MS because the technologies for these fungi have been not fully established. So I will now want to conclude uh, my talk and also highlight some of the major unmet needs. So for the rare and the rarest uh, molds that we have seen throughout this talk, we are highly dependent on conventional identification methods, culture and imaging. Only a few uh, laboratories that are specialized in this field hold uh, the expertise to perform molecular biased identification on clinical materials. IDS sequencing has been widely established in majority of the labs already with a good reference databases where we can blast against. So, and the phenotypic uh, identification, so without molecular methods is very challenging and you need to have a certain expertise as well. So you can differentiate all these rare fungal better chance. And often it's also recommended to either contact national reference centers or also seek help in some of the ECMM excellence centers that have dedicated expertise for these rare fungal better chance. And as I already highlighted, most of the data that I have shown and uh, that the guideline boards have uh, based their recommendations on they are not based on randomized uh, trials because due to the rare occurrence of these fun fungi, prospective randomized clinical trials are not available. So we are very much dependent on clinical registries such as fungiscopes that provide a very important database for us to refine diagnostics and treatment strategies and to specifically tailor uh, recommendations for this very rare fungal pathogens. So why do we need species identification and why do we need to identify fungal pathogens? Because first of all, I think it's always good to know your enemy and also its characteristics. So if we want to treat an infection properly, we need to know what fungi we are dealing with. And as I think became pretty clear from what I have presented today. We are not able to do that for a majority of uh, these very rare fungal better chance as the fair high for my seeds. Uh, so often uh, just from histology and uh, from direct microscopy, we can't name the fungus. We often need to uh, sequence uh, the fungus to actually get a name. It's extremely important to know with what pathogen we are dealing with because only then you can look into the guidelines and see how to best treat and manage the causative agent and how to cure your patient. It's also important to know basically what the intrinsic drug resistances are. Some of these fungi have a lot of intrinsic drug resistances and we only have three classes currently available. So we're very limited. And also some of these pathogens like Clomentospora prolificans is a multi-drug uh, 
resistant uh, fungus. So we have very limited treatment options. And it's also important to understand the local epidemiology. And actually, only if we know with what we are dealing with, we can collect, share, and create a knowledge base for also treatment, treating these fungal infections. So the priority research questions are that we have to meet, we need to desperately improve the diagnostics of rare fungal better chance to subsequently improve treatment strategies and vice versa. So that's a circle that we have to go back and forth to actually manage these infections in the future better. And here again, you see that we are mainly reliant still on classical uh, methods uh, and imaging technologies. So I think that's uh, the end of my talk. And I think we could try to do the bowl vote again. What do you think, Martin? Thanks so much, Michaela, for an outstanding talk. So while we were talking, actually people did the vote. So I will just end the bowling now. Um, I didn't dare to end the, the bowling um, and try to share the results. Okay. So can you see them as well here, Michaela? Yeah, I can see. Let's start with. So uh, the question number one was, our diagnostic lab offers for the diagnosis of fungal infection, what? So um, that's quite um, evenly distributed with two main uh, results. So exclusively microscopy, histology, and culture, that's about 30%. And then we have another 30% for microscopy, histology, culture, antifungal susceptibility testing, and nucleic acid-based tests. So about 60% of the uh, labs of the people that listen today basically cover the basis. And then we also have another 20% um, pulled together with antigen tests, culture and susceptibility testing. So uh, that's great. And actually uh, there's also some new candidate uh, labs that have the full panel about another 20%, so it's 80% that uh, in total that can cover all the different aspects. Uh, so all the, the basic uh, needs plus 20%, which have everything set up and only about 10% uh, don't know how the diagnosis is set, uh, but nobody has uh, chosen that they don't know uh, how the diagnostic has, has been established. So that was question number one. So that's not looking too bad. So question number two, how important do you rate antifungal susceptibility testing for your treatment strategy? So only one participant chose, I am not interested in antifungal susceptibility test results. But I think Michaela, all the participants can see the results actually. So you, ah, so they can see. You just highlight them. You don't have to walk completely through, but it's just. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, most basically chose species identification antifungal susceptibility thing is both important for target my treatment strategy. So um, that's about 60%. And then we have uh, species identification is more important for me than MIC values, another 13%. So um, that highlights again that that's really important for making your treatment decision. And uh, then we have some uh, diverse answers all over the place for that. And we go to question number two, how frequent do you diagnose infection due to Cytosporium or Lomentospora in your lab? Uh, about a fourth says none, uh, about a fourth says less than 10, and uh, about uh, another fourth has approximately uh, 10 cases uh, in, in their institution. And still some uh, don't know the local epidemiology. Um, and for question number four, how frequent do you diagnose infections due to fusarium in your lab a year? And majority says uh, less than 10 in neutropenic patients and some have more. 
and some also rated as the top three mold infections. So that fully depends, of course, on the background of the institution and what patients' cohorts they mainly see. So thank you very much uh, for that. Cool. So Michaela, I also have a few questions for you, which we can kind of like quickly answer before going on um, with treatment. And one um, is, is from Aria Kusiantu. Let me just stop sharing the results. So here, um, and she asks, do boriconazole MSC values for fusarium isolates ever correlate with clinical outcomes? So I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, kind of like yeah. discussion question, um, you know, what do you thought yeah. about this, Michaela? Yeah, Fusarium obviously has the worst uh, correlation uh, between MICs and clinical outcomes. So um, that question basically is answered. Now there's not much uh, uh, substance that MIC tests uh, correlate with the clinical outcome in the case of Fusariosis. But, but I have to add one thing, right? So I think we have some a bit of a great analysis on that from Marcinucci, um, um, who led a paper recently in Chuck um, investigating that. I think the one thing that's kind of like a caveat there is that most people with high MSCs got combination therapy. And actually the good outcome in those with high MSCs was really driven by those with combination therapy because there was significant better outcome in combination therapy once the MSCs are high, right? So that's kind of like the main thing. So it's, it, it, you know, it doesn't answer, it's, it's not a final answer, I think, to the question because high MSCs lead to combination treatment in clinical practice. And then basically this, the patient is still responding. But that's kind of like the big confounder there. So I would not conclude from this paper that despite high MSCs, you don't need combination therapy. I mean, that's kind of yeah. like, I think, not a conclusion that can be drawn. Um, but yeah, not very strong. So um, then there is one other question in the chat um, from Juliet. Um, so Juliette Guida, um, in a different tables, you present a different target for molecular, molecular diagnostics. Now I have to rewrite this up. Yeah. Um, it's identification of fungus culture. Is it useful for DNA extracted from Sierra? Um, oh yeah. So basically for the molecular diagnostics, you know, it's always the differentiation, whether, you know, it's from directly from clinical samples, whether it's, or just for isolates. So what are your thoughts about this? Obviously, I think not a lot of data for direct clinical sample testing. Yeah, the, the big problem is with uh, the extraction from clinical specimens, which is not standardized. Uh, so in the, in the guideline, we only recommend uh, identification based on pure cultures because we can be certain we gain enough DNA for proper identification. The broadest setup is, uh, for, is made for ITS sequencing. So there we have the most comprehensive databases that basically covers also all rare mold in fact uh, agents, but there is also other markers that are suitable, but there's not a broad database available. So I would stick to ITS sequencing for pure cultures. If you have an experienced lab, of course, you can also try to identify directly uh, this fungal species from biopsy material or also from bowel samples serum uh, if you basically have an experienced lab that is able to do that. Cool. And then there's two more questions. One is basically a remark of somebody responding, anonymously responding, um, that they have isolated agrostroma, magneo Tiolata. I've never heard that, as you can Sorry? Uh, Aquastoma magniotiolata. Yeah, I've never heard it before. Um, and I think, you know, it's just a remark that how important sequencing is, because obviously, if you're not sequencing, you may not be able to um, find so, such isolates. Um, and they are also not covered. It's kind of like super rare. They have not been able to um, find a case report. And that's why they were also not um, included in our guideline. And then one um, question um, from Anna Alastrui. Um, who says we sometimes have problems sequencing scopolaropsis um, ITS. Does it happen to other people as well? Um, and, and Anna says they usually have to do um, BCR with several primer pairs. As there, are there enough sequencing databases to sequence other genes with confidence? And in that case, which target is better to, be, to reach best species ID, DEF or B doubling, better doubling? Uh I would go for a DNF alpha marker yeah. for poscopolariopsis. And to basically, I think Anna is talking about pure cultures. So what we have seen is what actually really helps either having cultures that are grown only 24 hours. So very young uh, um, uh, mycelium that is not uh, pigmenting 
or either or otherwise try to culture the fungus in liquid medium uh, just overnight for 12 hours. And that gives you more than enough material to actually be able to extract. Sometimes it's an inhibition of uh, the sequencing reaction due to the melanin presence in, in these fungi. And that hinders basically the PCR amplification of the targets. So I think uh, liquid culture can be a way out or otherwise very young cultures that you have freshly subcultured. And then usually also IBS sequencing should work without problems. Thanks so much. And then one final question from Hasiman Kaur. Um, which database is the standard for comparing our sequencing results for fungi? Is it NCBI or ISHEM? Okay. Yeah, I prefer ISHEM because it's a validated database, IDS ISHEM database. So uh, there you have certified, identified um, IDS reference sequences. The problem with NCBI is that also less uh, experienced operators upload sequences and uh, they are also not updated. So if a species is renamed or found that a species was wrongly identified, that's not corrected. So you also get a lot of wrong hits. And also it's often not up to date. And especially if you want to uh, identify also species variants or complexes or more cryptic species, uh, then that's very hard to achieve uh, with NCBI because you will get a bulk of old identification first before you get the latest taxonomy, often because these uh, sequences have received in the past more hits. So I would always go with the ITS ISHEM data bank because that's constantly updated and uh, on the latest stage. Thanks so much, Michaela. Thanks so much for an outstanding presentation overcoming the technical um, Sorry for the technical issues. Um, but yeah, it was perfect, you know. <laughs> the ball uh, was um, not. Uh, but yeah, I you think know, it, it, it was working in the background. So we had it, at the end, we had some vote. We just need to give it some time. So thanks so much for outstanding presentation. And now let's move on um, to the treatment part. Thank and you, I'm happy. I'm happy to introduce um, Rosanne Sprute, um, who is um, a rising star and also one of the big unsung heroes um, of the guideline. Um, you know, really contributing a lot to this guideline. She's from the University of, of Cologne, and she will now present the treatment um, of rare mold infections. And I am very much looking forward to your presentation, Rosanne. Yeah, Martin, thank you very much for this really kind introduction. I will just try to share my presentation. Can you already see it? Yeah, great, perfect. So uh, yeah, I'm Rosanne Sprute from the University Hospital of Cologne. I'm doing my residency there at the moment um, in uh, the Institute of Professor Corneli. And, yeah, as uh, Martin uh, just said, I was uh, lucky that I um, could work together uh, with all these experts within the last one and a half years um, on this guideline. And uh, today I have the honor to present the treatment part. Um, first of all, I have nothing to disclose. Um, and since uh, Michaela already did such a great introduction to the guideline, I think we can directly dive into the topic. So I would um, start with a short overview over the antifungal treatments because I'm not sure if everyone is completely familiar with all substances and also because we might have um, people from different countries where not everything of the treatment options is available. I hope this is not boring for the ones that already know a lot about this. And then uh, we will review a few of the treatment pathways of the rare molds. Um, of course, not all of them. Uh, Michael already presented us a huge list that is covered in the guideline, but uh, well, you know where to find them, so it should be fine. <laughs> um, Surgery was actually the only option that we had um, in, until the 1950s for um, the treatment of invasive fungal infections. But luckily within the 1950s, there were several antifungal drugs discovered um, or developed um, starting with amphotericine B. Um, amphotericine B is um, um, a drug that binds to ergosterol, uh, that's a cell membrane component. Um, and um, causes holes in the, um, in the fungal cell membrane. Um, unfortunately, the substance amphotericine B is um, not that soluble. So it was combined with the deoxyhiolate that makes it more soluble. But um, this uh, combination also has a huge nephrotoxicity uh, and several other side um, effects. 
Um, so other formulations were, um, were developed uh, lipid formulations of amphotericin B um, that are actually uh, less nephrotoxic, but um, still have several side effects and um, are also quite expensive. So they are not always available. Um, and amphotericin B is a substance that we usually only give uh, intravenously, uh, except for some uh, local approaches. Um, Flucidazine is the next antifungal I just wanted to shortly introduce. Um, it was initially uh, developed as a cytostatic, but then it was uh, soon found, um, quite fast found that it is, um, has also antifungal potency and it inhibits the fungal DNA and RNA synthesis. Uh, one of the biggest side effects is the bone marrow, marrow toxicity. So if you already have patients with, a, with a already um, um, bone, marrow, um, bone marrow dysfunction, then you should really yeah, have a look on this. And uh, flucidazine is um, antifungal that you should always use in combination because uh, fungi quite uh, fast develop resistances against it. And it is uh, available as intravenous and oral um, um, substance. So this is a great thing about flucidazine. Uh, then we come to the azoles. Actually, for the treatment of the rare molds, um, this, uh, the second generation azoles like boriconazole, posaconazole, isabaconazole are the most uh, interesting ones. Um, azoles um, inhibit the ergosterol synthesis, so they also work on the um, cell membrane. Um, they exhibit quite a lot of liver toxicity and have a high interaction potency with the um, subsystem. And uh, therefore, for those um, class of antifungals, it's always important to uh, measure the serum levels um, with a therapeutic drug monitoring, particularly for boriconazole and posaconazole. Um, a really nice feature of this um, azole group is that uh, we have both intravenously and uh, oral um, administration options, so formulations really nice. And um, then we come to the echinocondines, it's cuspofungine, anidolofungine, and mycofungine mainly. Those substances uh, inhibit the beta deglucane synthesis, and this is um, a cell wall component, so something that we humans do not have, and this also explains uh, why this group has uh, not so many side effects. Um, but they, at the moment, they are only um, available for uh, intravenous, uh, intravenous formulations are available. Um, this might change <laughs> within the future. Um, and then we have turbinafine. Uh, this is a substance that is um, usually used for uh, dermatophyte infections, such uh, as uh, athlete's food, for example. Um, but it also has some importance in the um, treatment of rare mold infections. So that's why I just so shortly wanted to mention this one. Um, it inhibits uh, the ergosterol synthesis as uh, azoles do, but um, it yeah, inhibits another enzyme, so it's not completely the same mechanism, and they are available as tablets. Um, I also have a short poll. I will just start it and try because it's, whoops, it's a single one. Maybe it works, but I actually do not have the button to start it. Um, ah, here, I see. Let's see if I can start it. Mm, these are Michaela's questions. Mm, maybe we also can do it at the end. It's a bit sad because I would have loved to know uh, what uh, substances you have available, which we can maybe try later. Um, all right, so. Rosanne, Rosanne, yeah. if you just click on the top, um, on the top of your screen for the balls, you can go, or you already started it. Ah, now it started. Uh, yeah. Mike Jan, who, who started it. Okay, great. So maybe we can wait a second. Oh, that's perfect now. Now the votes are coming in. That's good. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, 
and we already see quite a result that uh, we have um, most treatment, most people here have all treatment uh, modalities available. That's of course great. Yeah, but some you no know, flucy design, this is also quite common, I think. Okay, great that this works. So we can already see most most people have all uh, treatment modalities uh, available. Great. I will um, stop it now. So uh, then we can already start with the first uh, fungus to discuss. Um, actually, those kind of treatment pathways that you can see on this side, uh, um, you can find them in the rare mold uh, guideline. Um, as Michaela already introduced to us, the whole, uh, all of the figures, uh, all of the pathways can be found in the supplement on the um, Lancet ID homepage. That's very important. And there um, also the um, treatment pathways are graded for uh, different clinical situations. For example, if some substances are not available, um, then we sometimes also provide tables how to continue in this situation. But I think for this, um, well, uh, audience, um, most people have everything available, so this is not such an issue. Today we will also just discuss the um, pathways where we have all options available. So uh, first of all, and this is uh, something that is true for all rare molds, um, invasive infections with rare molds are emergencies and they require rapid action. So an immediate treatment initiation should be, um, should be done. And um, yeah, this, um, this is a very important point. Um, whoops, that was a bit too fast. Um, surgical debridement was uh, been shown in fusariosis that it leads to a better outcome in the patients. So this is something that we are strongly recommending. And another thing is the removal of indwelling devices. So um, this has also been shown to improve the outcome of the patients. And if you have uh, fungemia, then you should always consider to remove indwelling devices. Um, as Michaela already mentioned, we do not have uh, randomized clinical trials for all this um, uh, fungi. So, uh, but what we can say is that the outcome with amphotericine B lipid formulations and boriconazole in fusariosis were similar. So both are recommended, are strongly recommended as first-line treatment. Again, TDM uh, for voriconazole is very important. Trough levels um, are between uh, recommended between 1.5 and 6 milligram per liter. This is a value that we know from uh, invasive aspergillosis, and it well, it, it's a good combination of uh, avoidance of toxicity, but a good uh, <coughs> clinical response. Um, well, as I said, the lack of, um, of um, clinical trials that are randomized um, also leads uh, to the issue that we actually don't really know if a monotherapy or a combination therapy is helpful for this fungus. Um, it's more helpful. Uh, actually, combination therapy is quite often used because uh, we get high mix back for voriconazole or amphotericin B. Uh, are because the patients are just so sick that you don't want to risk anything. So if uh, initially a combination therapy was used, uh, early step down to monotherapy, uh, as soon as MIC results come back is an approach that uh, is recommended. And uh, what you could also consider is a step down to voriconazole uh, oral formulation after a disease control was achieved in your patient. Um, for um, deoxycholate, amphotericin B was shown that this is uh, corresponding with lower survival rates in comparison yeah. to uh, amphotericin B uh, lipid formulations or voriconazole. So this is something you should avoid if you have um, other options available. Um, then we come already to the second fungus, lamentosporiosis. It's actually uh, a prolificant. Uh, that uh, was formerly classified as scalosporiosis. Um, here is uh, quite similar that surgery or surgical debris du Mans is um, strongly recommended because it leads uh, to an improved survival. Um, unfortunately for this fungus, we have a lot of uh, intrinsic resistances. Actually, it's intrinsically resistant to 
um, all of the, at the moment, available antifungals. However, it was shown that for voriconazole-based therapies, the outcome is the best. So we recommend voriconazole-based combination therapies in immunocompromised patients, for example, metobinophine or other antifungals, uh, plus minus other antifungals. Um, and for immunocompetent patients or just on localized infections, you could also discuss a monotherapy. Uh, again, TDM is very important uh, for voriconazole. And um, monotherapy uh, with liposomal amphotericin is uh, recommended against because we just see much better outcomes with voriconazole. Um, actually, for lomentosporium, the hope lies in new substances such as olorofem. So maybe these recommendations are changing within the next time. <laughs> um, then we have sketosporiosis. Um, there, a uh, voriconazole-based therapy leads to best outcome. Um, it's actually similar to fusariosis, but we don't really know if a combination therapy uh, improves the outcome. So um, this is only moderately recommended that we combine voriconazole with, for example, amphotericin B, uh, lipid formulations, echinocondines, or terpenophine. Um, for um, itraconazole, isovoconazole, and posoconazole, we have even less limited evidence. So. Uh, even um, even yeah, less uh, evidence. So we can only marginally recommend to use those substances. And it's the same again for uh, liposomal amphotericin B that we see uh, breakthrough infections and uh, clinical resistance. So um, the th therapy for sclerosporiosis should be voriconazole based. Um, this is already the last fungus I wanted to present today, Rasamsonia, one of the really rare, as uh, Michaela just introduced to us. Uh, actually, this genus was, uh, was uh, defined in 2011, it's comprising 11 species, and um, <coughs> mostly have case reports on the, on the outcome of the patients. Um, surgery is therefore also just moderately recommended. And um, what is seen that echinocondines lead to a good clinical outcome. So cuspofungin or microfungin, maybe in combination with a liposomal amphotericin B or posoconazole, um, make a good outcome in this patient or a better outcome than, for example, with azole monotherapy, because uh, we can see um, high minimal inhibitory concentrations and also clinical failure. So the, there seems to be a collaborate, collab um, correlation uh, as soon as you can say it with such a small um, group of patients. Um, and here we have a really convenient overview that you can find in the guideline uh, where you can find all the antifungals that we couldn't introduce all today and uh, where you can also find dosing recommendations, uh, recommendations on prophylaxis, on salvage treatment, uh, treatment of um, Children, also very important because we didn't include this today. Um, and because we talked so much about uh, rare mold infections and also because uh, um, Michaela already mentioned it shortly, uh, we have a, a global registry for rare emerging invasive fungal infection that was, uh, um, that was started in 2003 by Oliver Corneli and uh, his team. And uh, this has a quite handy way of collecting the data via an online questionnaire. Um, and it is also possible if you uh, make case entries that this results into a publication because we uh, sometimes publish those case, uh, case series. And yeah, so um, if you have a, a, um, a rare mold, uh, um, you can inf um, get information on the Fungiscope uh, website or at Fungiscope on Twitter, or you can just drop me an email and then we can discuss if your, uh, what your case might fit into the registry and I can guide you through the um, registry process. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your attention and um, special thanks to uh, Oliver and Martin who, uh, yeah, who just uh, had set up this nice webinar and the whole guideline initiative and also to the Cologne team um, because, uh, well, they 
just have a lot of work with these guidelines and uh, all global guideline co-authors and collaborators, of course. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosanne, for an outstanding presentation, presenting very clearly the most important messages for the most important fungi of the rare mold guideline, I mean, for the most common of the rare molds, actually. So um, let me just quickly start off, and we have a few questions coming in, but I think like the one thing to emphasize, it's just something I want to kind of like emphasize in current times where we know it's, you know, we have the um, mucomycosis crisis, um, COVID-associated mucomycosis crisis in India, where really lots of centers don't have any antifungal that's active against mucomycosis available anymore. Um, no amphotericin B, um, no azoles, um, really nothing. Um, so it's important to emphasize, although the majority really have all the treatment modalities available, there is a good amount of, of centers, even in this Europe-centered webinar with some participants from outside Europe that don't have everything. So, you know, it's definitely, we need to get better there. We need to make sure that, you know, more anti you know, more, all the classes are really available in all participate in all centers that treat these rare mold infections. Um, let me just stop sharing. Um, so one of the questions, let me go to the questions that um, came up. Um, and one of them basically um, may also be answered by Michaela, actually, it's, um, and also by you, it, it's kind of like specifically from Alexander Bonifaz from Mexico. Um, how often do you see um, Fusarium uh, macroconidia in blood? So how often is this resulting positive? In what proportion? Susanne, do you want to answer? Or should I, I think <laughs> probably you know much better than me, so. <laughs> I have to be honest, I have never seen it. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I'm not sure how often that's detected, but uh, we also don't perform um, uh, microscopy based on blood so that's not a common approach uh, so um, I'm not sure because you would basically need to perform a red blood cell lysis. Uh, Anna Illustrate just popped in she has seen it but very rare so you need basically to first lyse the blood and then spin it down and enrich the conidia and then do direct microscopy on blood. Uh, Anna said she actually has seen it once and they are the Spanish reference centers so uh, it's obviously very rare. I don't think how many labs actually do that direct microscopy on blood uh, from fusarium cases. Thanks so much, Michaela. And that's actually, you know, just to not confuse specifically about fusarium macroconidia, right? We know, of course, that blood cultures re um, result positive in a good amount of fusarium species. Yeah. So this is actually, you know, probably the most um, um, frequent um, um, mode of detection for invasive fusariosis. Uh, Anna um, just corrected herself and she said she has never seen it from direct microscopy. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so okay. So Super I rare. think uh, the blood cultures, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's also recommended uh, strongly to perform blood cultures for fusarium cases. Therefore, obviously, there has to be either fragments of uh, mycelium or micro or microconidia, but what basically causes the positivity of the blood culture is, to my knowledge, unknown if what sort of spores or have a fragments circulating. Cool. So um, there are other questions popping in, one from Anna Rastrui. Um, if you don't have um, therapeutic drug monitoring available in your center, will you recommend to use voriconazole or, and that's kind of like a tough question, instead um, use isovuconazole, for example, which we know has much more favorable and predictable pharmacokinetics. Um, and if you don't have DDM nor isovuconazole, what would you recommend to do, implement um, DDM or try to go to isovuconazole? Um, what are your thoughts here, Rosanne? Well, uh Maybe you can help later. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I would say if isobuconazole is available and if there are any data that it's working against this rare mold, then uh, would for sure be an option. But uh, yeah, maybe. I think, yeah. So I think, you know, obviously, I mean, first of all, you should definitely kind of like go towards implementation of therapeutic drug monitoring for voriconazole because there's still indications where you need to use voriconazole and where the center will use it. So that's kind of like the one thing I would definitely emphasize. All centers that don't do it yet, um, try to get it implemented. Um, it's, you know, there's reference laboratories and there's even kind of like a reference um, 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 program that is, um, I think, led um, in, from the Netherlands, but Brueggemann, who can kind of like, you know, verify or quantify, or qu 
verified equality um, of your center to do this. So um, this should be relatively straightforward. Um, that would be by priority. In terms of kind of like using ad other azoles, um, like isobuconazole or, you know, bosaconazole, corfusarium, we just don't have a ton of data, right? We believe it would work, right? But the number of, of, of cases that we have and the, the amount of data we are currently having is limited. So, you know, I would not use this as primary option, but it's definitely an option um, to use, you know, if you, for example, don't have um, azole drug monitoring. And we also have um, amphotericin B um, lipid formulations, which are kind of like equally um, strongly um, recommended. So this would be my prime choice here. You know, if you don't have um, um, therapeutic drug monitoring for voriconazole, maybe you should use primarily um, for their liposomal amphotericin B or ABLC. Um, that would be my prime. Um, and then, you know, step down, of course, to nasal, but that primarily, you know, amphotericin B probably would be the solution here. And let me see some others. So many questions now popping in. So everybody, lots of discussion here. Uh, yes, Christoph shows interest. <laughs> yeah, Christoph Hennequin um, um, asks: Do we have to conclude that identification of the complex species level or at the cryptic species level is of no mean to ad adopt an the antifungal treatment of those infections? Maybe also kind of like a joint question that also goes to um, 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 uh, Michaela. It's of course you know a hot topic. Definitely you know something many centers are working and data are emerging on these um, rare and cryptic species? Yeah, so I think basically in general, there's, um, there is a guideline paper out that basically concluded that for um, the clinical context, we are fine going to species complex levels. So there is only few occasions where really going further down than species complex level actually adds value. And um, so, the, of course, there is some cryptic species within Aspergillus fumigatus, for example, where we do have differences, known differences in ASO susceptibility. But we would also basically catch them up with performing, in addition, antifungal susceptibility testing, which is recommended for these class of fungi. So I would say going to the cryptic species level, that's more for big centers or reference laboratories that basically overview the epidemiological situation and if they know that there's a high occurrence of cryptic species in a country, you might implement uh, some of that in addition. But in general, if you have 2% uh, ratio of cryptic species of Aspergillus fumigatus, for example, occurring, and 98% is still Aspergillus fumigatus sensus stricto, what's basically, you know, it has to be also a correlation with. Uh, effort and basically read out. So I think that's maybe a bit of an overkill for a normal lab to do. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Michaela. So um, one other remark um, from, um, from Pasiram Kaur again, um, we have seen for Sarah Macro-Canadian blood culture two to three times in a year in India. So, you know, yeah. just a remark towards for the, for the prior question. Um, and then um, there is one question again, I think for you, Michaela, from Irene Grant. Um, is KOH testing still recommended on suspicious um, specimens? Yeah. Okay. Quick um, response here. Um, but for, the, me... for the Hialo high for my seats, I per uh, per personally uh, also favor very much uh, crocot stain because sometimes the hyaline half is extremely difficult to see in histological preparations. And with the crocot stain, that's the silver stain, they turn black and they really stand out. So I think that's much easier, uh, especially for the, uh, higher, uh, uh, for the transparent hyaline hyphae. I think that's really useful. For the fair hyphomycetes that are pigmented themselves, uh, it's also possible to perform a pass or other uh, stains that uh, do not stand out, make the hyphae stand out so much. Um, and I think, you know, we're also coming to the conclusion in terms of already being over the time a little bit. So there are also some specific questions about um, natamycin against um, mycotic heritiditis, 
Um, this is obviously depending on kind of like which pathogen is um, causing that. So I think I really can refer here also to the supplement of our guideline, which kind of like really lists, you know, all case reports of successful treatment. Obviously, there's not a ton of evidence um, for, you know, the, the more um, special this gets, um, you know, certain fungi then causing um, 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 keratitis. Um, this is going down to single case reports that uh, mostly report successful treatment with various um, agents. The good thing is that we have, you know, in the supplement really a detailed tables, um, you know, 50 bit tables or so, which kind of like show you um, these um, combinations mostly that have been used successfully. Um, so this is to answer that question. Um, then there is um, um, one additional comment from Irene Grant that KOH testing is now not being done in the USA in most community hospitals um, because it cannot be automated. I think that's an important, um, um, you know, mm -hmm. point that the more um, laboratories are kind of like triggered towards doing um, only um, um, evaluations that, you know, pay off basically and, and bring some revenue to the laboratory, um, the less, of course, um, there is um, um, availability of, you know, these methods to define these rare molds because these rare molds never will bring a big revenue to the laboratory. So much of these um, uh, methods um, are not encouraged, which I don't think is a, a good um, development, but I know it's kind of like it's really impacting. And microbiologists yeah, yeah. are suffering a lot in the US um, from these um, from this uh, financial pressure, actually. So problem is also the same with the selective media. Yeah, that they are not offered in all the centers. So there has to be a special focus, I guess, from the center as well. And I think also the physicians, treating physicians, if they have especially a lot of patient cohorts at risk, they need to make pressure on their uh, clinics to basically allow for more broader setup diagnostics because basically if you don't know what you're dealing with you have no chance to treat it. Yeah very important. Then last comment also again from Christopher Nigreen I'm um, following up that his question wasn't only about cryptic species but also the higher level of species complex and I think you know otherwise if for Sunny wants to add something, please add now. But otherwise, I can also this is specifically for Sarum solani um, complex or um, for for Sarum oxysporum um, 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 infection and how this differs. I mean, obviously, I think we again kind of like touching. We are kind of coming from rare to very rare. That's the main thing, and kind of like the level of evidence we have. It may very well um, differ. We just don't have a big amount of evidence, so it will be kind of like you know marginal and moderate recommendations. But nevertheless, you can find these recommendations in the detailed tables um, of the of um, our guideline in the supplement. I don't know if you or Sunny wants to add something about this question specifically on Fosarium. I think I should also look it up in our guideline, <laughs> to be honest. We try to be really, you know, we have, um, I think, 4,000 people, right? We're really inclusive in terms of um, what to include. But obviously, you know, lots of the evidence um, is based on single case reports. So it we don't have strong recommendations on what to do. Um, but, you know, I think the future and we'll definitely, you know, we will see more of these cases sometimes and, and some additional evidence will um, emerge that maybe, you know, even for Fusarum, we have to differentiate in terms of how we treat, I um, mean, in terms of the different species. Right now, we don't have the evidence. So it's kind of like, you know, one frequent recommendation for all Fusarum species. Okay, and with that, um, I want to kind of like thank again, first of all, the speakers, um, Rosanne and Michaela, um, outstanding presentations, both of you very clear. Um, so I think really outstanding job um, done. Um, and then of course, also the audience um, who voted and who, who stayed with us um, even 10 minutes more um, than this was originally scheduled. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a good evening, day or night, wherever you are. And um, looking forward to see you at our next um, guideline seminar um, later in summer or early fall. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>